what I'd really like to talk about today is um, whilst we're looking at optimised uh, rolling stock, what we believe at Instrumental is the key is the collaboration piece. So how do we make sure that everybody is pointing in the same direction as we move forwards? Um, more than happy that we can talk uh, to any of the um, attendees um, through the question and answer session later, um, but also feel free to reach out and contact me um, directly. Uh, my contact details are there or via the, the platform itself. A very brief history about Instrumentel. Um, we are a, a spin out of Leeds University um, back in 2001. Um, we've worked in a number of different industries, um, quite a rich heritage on the rail side, um, spanning, uh, spanning across um, different assets, but focusing on things such as doors and engines um, <clears throat> on rolling stock, as well as um, some work on monitoring infrastructure as well. But we have um, started our life as an um, expert designer and builder of telemetry systems, looking at how to capture data in extreme environments. So those extremes might be the epicenter of an explosion where we can monitor temperature and pressure or down wells or at nuclear facilities where you're not wanting people to go and visit pretty often. So uh, we address the challenges of the industry by making data available, but then turning data into actionable, usable information. I'll give a quick overview of where we sit within the Unipark group. Um, <clears throat> two years ago, three years ago now, we were acquired by Unipark group uh, we now form part of the Unipart Technologies Group, along with some of the other technology businesses. And there may be some people and some companies within Unipart Rail that you'll recognize there, a number of joint ventures around the globe, um, as well as part of the um, existing Unipart Group, where the logistics team serve the likes of the NHS. And I've got to say, they've done a fantastic job um, during this pandemic. Um, our teams face at all of the different um, Distribution centers have gone above and beyond. Um, and also our sister company, Metlays, which is our joint venture with Rolls-Royce, um, was involved in the production of ventilators as part of the original uh, stage of the pandemic. So we've got a lot of experience of implementing new technology into different industries um, <clears throat> and supporting our customers in really challenging times. But what does that mean for condition monitoring? and how do we set ourselves apart? <clears throat> so the first thing to say is that whilst we are heavily experienced on the rail side, we've also got a lot of experience within Formula One. So this is where our systems are used inside um, the development of engines, where we use uh, inductively coupled miniature electronics <clears throat> to capture the uh, behavior of an engine. And this is, I'll be clear, not whilst it's running around on track, this is whilst they're developing the engine, how to make it most efficient, how to make it uh, as lightweight as possible. Um, but what we're doing is capturing uh, telemetry on the piston, the valves, um, to deliver optimal performance. As you can imagine, that's quite important uh, in Formula One. And so to do that, we're capturing more than a million samples per second, so that every fraction of a second can be utilized to improve that overall performance. The extreme environment that we talk about there is also the need to operate at over 220 degrees, which isn't something which uh, electronics typically like. So how does that translate to a rail vehicle? We don't think of uh, maintenance on rail vehicles as being the same as a pit stop, but that's what we're trying to implement. That's the thought process that we're trying to do, is that everything that comes in uh, to a depot, everything is ready, all the people are in the right place at the right time, all of the... Um, maintenance tasks are stacked up it might take longer than two seconds we appreciate that but everything should be slick and ready to go so that you're making the better decisions so in order to enable that we fit ruggedized sensors to monitor those key parameters on the train we're not monitoring at a million samples per second but we're uh, calculating the overall uh, engine power and the health of the entire powertrain which is one of the critical elements we're continuously sampling that data and integrating with existing systems and sensors. And this starts the piece that I talk about in terms of collaboration. How do you make sure that you're pulling all of the right information together at the right time? Now, I'll quickly 
give an overview of our uh, system and what it might look like in the way you've got sensors and our diagnostic hub fitted to uh, an asset. All that data is pulled into our data center where we integrate to third party systems or into um, our own parts management systems within Unipart Rail. And all that's available via Paradigm Insight, um, where it's just fully customizable across the piece. So all of that is within our own gift to design, build and tailor. But everything is about turning it into usable, actionable information. Now, Robert touched upon what do we um, see as the overall goal? Where could we get to? Um, because it's true that some um, operations, some uh, rolling stock is still maintained in a very conventional manner. So at the very start of this journey here, we've got no diagnostics and data. So if you think about an older uh, style train, which is very manual, say for example, a, an older type diesel, it's all based on mileage or it's based on the time between overhauls. As soon as um, monitoring equipment is installed, there are benefits to be gained. And that's things such as uh, guided fault finding. And you can start to reduce repeat errors and um, no fault found incidents quite quickly. So there are things that quite quickly you can get a return on your investment. But there is the end goal where we have that optimized maintenance. As we move towards that, that goal, uh, guided fault finding can save that time. And we've seen that. We've um, got customers that have proved that uh, fault finding um, time saving. When you've been able to monitor for a significant amount of time, you're then in a position to be able to uh, predict fault identification, prevent those uh, failures in service before that final goal where you're maintaining solely on the condition of your asset. So you're not over maintaining just in case, and you're not under maintaining and having those costly failures in service. And every time, all the time that you're monitoring, you're improving your understanding of how assets behave, how they degrade, and how effective maintenance is. We've seen examples, and I'll give the example of uh, train doors, whereby because they're a problem area, they are maintained every eight weeks someone is looking at them and fiddling with them to make sure that they fit the OEM's time that they should uh, operate. The practicalities of doing that is actually they're uh, making the um, asset perform worse and having further failures in service because they're interfering with the system and trying to make it do something which it wasn't ever intended to do. So they're cranking up their um, motor current or the pneumatic pressure to make it fit a timing and that's causing knock-on effects. There are so many different ways that you can utilize data <clears throat> to turn it into information that can uh, lead to better decisions and better uh, reliability on the network. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about who is involved in the maintenance of a vehicle. And I'll give an example of a um, cross country uh, class 170 in the UK known as a turbo star. Um, so the train owner who sets the safety case owns the vehicle signs off any changes, Waterbrook here. Um, the operator as cross country <clears throat> have a vested interest. The depot staff are actually not cross countries though, they're West Midlands trains. The CBM provider in this instance is uh, Instrumentel. Uh, the analytics and um, understanding of what to do with that data is provided by Instrumentel, but also other um, parties as well. And there are engine specialists here um, so the likes of LH and MTU, <clears throat> all of these um, different parties have a role to play in maintaining the engine of this vehicle, making sure that it doesn't fail and making sure that it can meet its um, required power output for service. But also supporting that is the supply chain, is the material to support that maintenance on board as well. And that's where Instrumental and Unipart Rail can really dovetail to provide not just the instructions to say this engine needs maintaining now, <clears throat> but also the material to do the work in the right place at the right time. I'll give a quick overview of the project that we have um, been working on with Cross Country. <clears throat> we were uh, engaged by Cross Country to develop an engine and fuel monitoring solution. This was primarily focused on how can fuel reductions be made. <clears throat> 
we provided that solution. Um, first half of uh, 2019 provided that real time data on fuel usage, <clears throat> which has led them to identify areas which can reduce fuel savings. So if you think of a, even a 1% reduction across a fleet of 80 vehicles, it's quite a significant saving. That is expected to be resulted on just a changing the way that the vehicle is powered when it's in the depot. There are some um, different fuel efficiency algorithms that we've developed. But the most important thing to um, the operator, to the Roscoe uh, and to ourselves was actually focusing on engine reliability. How do we make these vehicles more reliable? And in 20, uh, the end of 2019, uh, we sat down, all the parties together, took a collaborative view of what is the most optimal set of um, systems to monitor on a train. Uh, I think, as Robert said, we could monitor absolutely everything. And in some cases, we might want to do that because you don't know what you don't know yet. Um, but we know that the improving the performance of these vehicles is so important to focus on the engines, the transmission, the hydrostatics and things such as, you know, the main reservoir pressure. From that, we've then designed an instrumental system to capture all of the data and provide it directly to um, Porterbrook, but also via our web portal Paradigm Insight. <clears throat> so the installation for the fleet has commenced. And we're doing this in line with the overhaul program, the C8 program uh, for cross country trains, um, so that we are minimizing the downtime. It's all well and good saying we'll minimize the downtime of your vehicles if it takes you twice as long to actually fit the equipment or you're having to go back every week to change it. That's not an overall. You need to look at the overall picture and who is um, involved. And data right now is coming from uh, these trains directly into Porterbrook and also to. Um, the operator via our portal Paradigm Insight. So what's next? Installations are continuing throughout the year and we're running analytics on uh, the fleet wide data that we've got. The big challenge we have ahead of us is to change that maintenance program to include the insight from condition based maintenance. And that has to be as a result of that collaboration piece. We need to change the maintenance instructions, maintenance planning, the behaviors of the people um, in train operations, as well as the depot staff. That's not a small challenge, but we've got a plan to do that, which involves a number of different experts. And the target is to reduce nationwide engine failures by up to 60%. It's an ambitious target, but we think it's achievable from what we've seen in our initial trials and in the data. So we're looking to make a significant change by reducing those failures. Not only are you improving the service for the operators and the uh, ne um, track infrastructure uh, maintainers and managers, but also the end passenger. Nobody wants to be sat on a train that's broken down. One of the next days in the project is also that we're going to monitor. Uh, we're going to equip a train to monitor absolutely every critical asset that's on there. So not just the engine, the fuel. Um, we've got a long experience of monitoring other subsystems such as doors, such as batteries, you know, electrical signals where on a train we're monitoring a million samples per second. But what we need to do in this again is in collaboration with Porterbrook and Cross Country is equip an entire train with data, uh, with uh, monitoring equipment so that we can see what other data could be used. And we're looking to harness the existing sensors where possible. So not having to add to the cost of adding additional equipment, trying to make a cost effective solution to provide data into um, decision makers hands in the right way. I can give a quick overview of some of the other um, uses of our uh, system. So we have uh, our um, fleet in Scotland monitoring um, data coming out of their OTMR system. So Again, not fitting additional sensors, not being invasive, extracting data that or, that's already there, but providing that data in a way that is actually improving the maintenance practices for the teams. So as they said themselves, because they can access it remotely, they're minimizing that maintenance downtime. And we're running machine learning algorithms to understand the overall health of that asset just from the um, on-train uh, monitoring recorder.
there's also the example I'd like to give of where train monitoring data is being used by network rail as well as the operator. So this is monitoring brake systems on uh, a set of trains in um, West Midlands in and around Birmingham. So we're monitoring braking efficiency uh, and identifying areas of wheel slip. So the trains are being worked on because they have insight into where there are maybe problems with either the braking system with the wheels, <clears throat> but also we are providing this output as a daily report to network rail so that their track maintenance teams during the um, heavy leaf fall seasons are targeting the uh, hot spots where um, they can make a difference <clears throat> to making sure that wheel slip doesn't keep repeating. <clears throat> so this is looking at an overall train system and not just considering what's my train doing, but also the track, also operations. How do we get the most out of the maintenance teams and the most out of the assets that we have? Um, uh, shall we have a look at, as we get to the end of your session, have a look at the poll results? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, can can you see the poll or do you want me to recount the results? Uh, if you would, Robert. Yeah, okay. So some of the uh, the answers that the, you've given uh, the, the team in the audience uh, actually tie in quite closely with what Sam was just saying. So if you remember, the question was, what would be most challenging to implement CBM in a project? The number one point that the audience highlighted was changing practices for the maintenance personnel. So the, the new way of working and living, uh, which is actually something you said a few minutes ago, Sam. That was number one. Second was the analytics. So what to do with the data and how to make value of it that we'll, we'll talk through the panel discussion. And then equal third place was implementing the, the technology and uh, together with uh, the, the maintenance plans uh, to take account that you now have a layer of data available. Um, you know, so it's quite good, the audience uh, quite in tune with what you, you presented, Sam. So the next session we have is for Yannick uh, to uh, present uh, Alstom uh, to us. Good morning, uh, all. Uh, hopefully you, you hear me well. Uh, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, present uh, what uh, Alstom um, is providing now as solutions during this uh, pandemic period. Um, actually, Alstom is well known as uh, providing uh, reliable solutions. Now the challenge is for us for providing uh, solutions uh, helping uh, uh, passengers having a, a good trust and and faith in uh, in traveling uh, in a, in a very safe conditions. So to do so, um, what we have done uh, starting last year um, is to organize a dedicated team centrally with a couple of experts on on rolling stock and services, but as well obviously. Um, integrating uh, new experts from outside bodies, especially in uh, certifications and in uh, testing new solutions for making sure that we are respecting uh, sanitary conditions, especially uh, against uh, coronavirus. Uh, so we have created partnerships and we have developed as well a specific uh, process for validating our solution in labs and validation validation of our solution on the field. Uh, so that's uh, the key uh, the key added value for all our customers, but as well for our project, because uh, we are running more than 150 maintenance projects worldwide, and we wanted as well to provide uh, solutions to our uh, project and customers, and capitalizing worldwide all the best solution today. Uh, this is a very dynamic market, a very large landscape, and we had to uh, be uh, more selective and uh, uh, being sure that we are implementing for our project and customers long-term solution uh, in this new, uh, new environment. Okay, so our um, portfolio um, of solutions um, is organized around 
the the challenge that our customers are, are facing and the challenge i would say is representing on the left hand side uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmissions are done mainly by two uh, two means, uh, airborne transmissions and contact transmissions. So what we have organized is specific uh, working group for addressing uh, this, uh, this challenge and limiting the transmission. So for this, our, our catalog of solution is, uh, is organized around five pillars, defining a referential with Bureau Veritas and Institut Pasteur of Lille in order to make sure that we have a proven solution against SARS-CoV-2 and a specific uh, process validation. Um, and we have dedicated rolling stock experts on air treatment or on HVAC, on contact leg solution for the interiors of the, of the rolling stock, uh, passenger flow control uh, at the station and in the cars, contact surfaces materials, where we have uh, uh, very good innovations for interiors with various side product, and the uh, fundamental uh, activities for our customers and to uh, provide a safe condition for passengers, which are all cleaning and disinfection solutions. So all these uh, working group are working together to provide a solution today. And uh, our, our main concern in Alstom is to uh, support customers today and to develop a long-term solution inside the rolling stock for uh, during, during new design of product, but as well uh, for providing uh, maintenance solutions considering the, the new con context we, we are facing. What is available today, we have in our catalog the cleaning and disinfection solution available for implementation. We have a HVAC system optimization for maximizing fresh air in coordination with uh, our customers, but as well our suppliers, partners, for implementing uh, this, um, this solution for optimizing the air ventilation and controlling uh, passenger flows in the station, but as well in the cars, for uh, limiting um, uh, too, too many too many people in the same in the same car. Uh, tomorrow, and we are uh, having an ongoing validation process of new innovative solution, again in cleaning and disinfection with uh, very promising technologies on uh, on spray coating technologies, for example. Uh, which are uh, currently under under final testing and uh, very, very promising. I will come back on it. New materials for interiors. It could be, it could be paintings. It could be a material for the seats. Um, and um, it could be as well some innovation on a contactless um, uh, benefit for the, for the passengers. And uh, it could be as well innovations, you will see that on the air treatment in order to maximize a very, very good condition of the air and the ventilation inside the, the cars. So um, you see that uh, again, um, today's solutions are available and tomorrow under, under development. If we are doing a key focus on a priority one, I would say from all our customers um, and um, operators worldwide, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have seen with the team that the number one priority is innovation and implementation of solution on cleaning and disinfection. And for that, we have identified three main uh, solutions with three uh, dedicated proven suppliers, validated and proven by, um, as I said, external bodies. Uh, in, in order to make sure that we have uh, absolute uh, uh, good efficiency against SARS-CoV-2. And uh, the three main protocols are manual disinfection, where we control very well the application, um, application with a uh, nebulizer equipment in order to be much faster and reaching all potential surfaces, and third solution, which is very promising as well, is long-term treatment where we can get uh, um, an efficiency for several months, and which is very, very appreciated by uh, all uh, customers and for the benefit always uh, in safe, very safe condition of all the passengers. So you see various type of solutions 
uh, with uh, um, a lot of benefit for for the passengers um, and really uh, op really helping as well operators to uh, uh, get trust trust again from all um, all the passengers to travel to travel in public transportation. The second pillar in uh, maintenance activities and um, getting trust is uh, in optimizing solution for the air treatment and ventilation. So we are implementing today solutions with uh, operators and with our suppliers on maximizing fresh air and reinforcing the filtration with always the condition to respect all the specification in terms of temperatures, pressure, in order to maintain the same environment and same conditions uh, as expected by, uh, by our customers. And these solutions are today implemented with various customers in, um, in various countries. Last point I wanted to, uh, to share with you, uh, which is uh, as well a very important request from all operators um, and, and, and we see um, a very good result already on new technologies. You mentioned it, Robert, new technologies are there. Now the key point is validation. That's what we are doing uh, since uh, beginning of last year, validating uh, every week new solution and new technologies. And so we are introducing with all tier one HVAC suppliers, the, the, all the famous ones, uh, innovation on HVAC in mainly four directions, improving filtration grade, introducing UV lamps in our HVAC solutions, introducing electrostatic filters and introducing ionization uh, technologies in, uh, in HVAC. All of this um, is uh, definitely showing in labs and on the field very good results for improving the, the quality of the air and a much, much safer conditions for, for traveling for all, all our passengers. So you see now in a, in a, in a short and, and uh, brief um, uh, speech that we, uh, we have um, global solutions, but what we are as well willing to do is to find sometimes dedicated solutions for, uh, for our customers because they may have some interest on a specific area. And that's what we are uh, what we are willing to do um, with all all customers. So I hope it it has been um, uh, helpful. And now you you can see uh, maybe a little bit more in detail um, where where Alstom is uh, is focused on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Now everybody to our panel discussion, and we do we do have another poll that we will uh, circulate to, to make sure the audience is uh, is still awake. Um, so I was going to suggest, why don't we start with uh, uh, Christian and Stephanie um, who haven't spoken yet. So so Christian, why don't you introduce yourself and perhaps give us a flavour of where you see uh, the maintenance uh, domain going in the coming years? Yes, sure. Um, Christian from Guts Partners. We are a management consulting company, and um, yeah, just to catch up what you what you said in the beginning, Robert. Um, I think this the digitalization of maintenance is a huge opportunity for the oldest startup in the world, the railway system, um, to improve its cost and its quality base. Um, you said it's thirty percent. Sometimes it's unfortunately even more. <clears throat> the cost for maintenance. And I think um, this is the greatest opportunity to reduce this cost base and make railway not only environmentally com competitive, but also on a cost base more competitive. Um, maybe two points in all, also Sam, you, you mentioned many of those already. Um, there are many tools already available. Uh, many, many of the uh, uh, tools are available and it's, it's, it's possible to improve but it's hard to implement. So what we see with our clients is that having the technology, whether it's the hardware, the software or whatever, which part of, of the value chain of the technology, the, it's very hard um, in the end to, to have success with the technology with respect to p l effect. So really realize um, improvements in their own cost base. So that's really hard. That's one point and that's 
because it's it 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 requires adjustment in the organizational structure, meaning people in processes, how people work, how processes interact with other heritage data systems. Most of the time, it's not greenfield; it's brownfield, right? So it's many things are involved, and this all also will, would be my second point a bit. Just to add up here to 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 what you said, um, the heterogeneity of systems in place. It's not just one software solution that monitors something and gives a nice dashboard. Um, there's also from the OEMs, the the Alstom, Siemens, Stadler companies. They do have systems. Um, then there are specialized providers, the suppliers. So there are many in the field. Everybody has some part of the solution. It's very hard for the user in the end to see everything and to put it into one process. This is there's a lot of synthesis uh, involved. So thinking about it, how does it work together? How may to simplify it? Um, that's hard. And when when we uh, support clients, um, we usually and that's uh, maybe that also mirrors a bit with what we saw in the polls today, but also in a panel yesterday. Um, this is still probably a, a big challenge for the next years to fit all these very interesting pieces into into organizations, into into companies that uh, um, that operate rolling stock. Okay, thanks, Christian. Very interesting. Um, so, Stephanie, can I ask the same that you introduce yourself and then uh, give us a flavour of where Porterbrook is heading? Yeah, brilliant. So um, I'm Steph Kecker. I'm head of digital services at Porterbrook. And just for everyone's benefit on the call, that Porterbrook own nearly a third of all the passenger rolling stock in the UK. So we're kind of a quiet partner in the background, but actually have quite significant reach. And really, um, my job at the moment is to kind of look at Porterbrook's strategy on the, in the digital space and really understand you know, what is our place. So we're looking at our rolling stock to see what can we do with the data that's either coming off it or what can we equip these vehicles with to get more data off there to actually improve the performance and reliability of the asset base? And that's really critical to us because that's our business model. Um, but equally, it's looking at this interaction with the infrastructure. Can you be using the rolling stock for the benefit of the whole rail system, not just the siloed approach? And I think what Christian's just touched on, that integration, the interconnection is actually really complex, especially in the UK where you have so many different partners. And mm -hmm. I think you showed that in your slide with the train operator, the, the asset owner, we've got maintainers on several levels, we've got lots of third parties who have great expertise in data analytics. How do you connect all these people and reward all these people for their efforts? And I think at the moment that's also something that's going through quite considerable reform is understanding how the commercial interaction works as well as the people and process interaction. So, you know, if Porterbrook's going to invest really heavily in remote condition monitoring, it's no good if we're just pumping out data that doesn't make a difference to the PL. And Christian, I think that was your point really, is that I think sometimes people imagine that the hardware bit is the most challenging. Well, actually, there are big challenges in hardware, but the people side and building those processes to make sure they're compliant with standards and are workable on the ground is really tough. And I think we're in this phase at the moment of a blended approach where ideally we would be you know, purely condition based, but that's not realistic. And how do you turn um, maintenance and depot environments that are kind of very beat frequency structured into a more agile approach but work that into the planning system, you know, that, that's a real challenge. So I think amongst the group of us here on the panel, we've probably all got lots of experience in all the key areas of that. And as Porterbrook, we've got to make that a, like a tangible benefit to the asset, otherwise it's not worth doing. So that's really, you know, from Porterbrook's perspective, we need our rolling stock to be generating value for the industry. And I think the digitization is gonna be absolutely critical to that. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting what you said that uh, we recently at Arup have helped some clients understand the different re regimes around the world. Uh, European models, uh, U UK slightly different, some of Europe. Um, we've got uh, different regimes in Asia, uh, Australasia, uh, the Americas and so on. And you're right, the interoperable railway in Europe, meaning that you have infrastructure managers responsible for the, the permanent way. Uh, sometimes one large company, uh, a national uh, infrastructure manager, otherwise local entities looking after the, the regional routes. And then you have interoperable services with different companies operating trains, different companies maintaining. And it means when we talk about system engineering with our clients, we also say that the commercial interfaces need to be mapped 
just as importantly as the technical interfaces between the machines. Whereas 20 years ago, we would have focused more on the technical interfaces, but now the contractual relationships just as key. Yeah, so, so just looking forward a little bit, I was thinking, Sam, um, we were just talking about implementing uh, digital solutions. Um, it could be onto existing trains or new trains. In terms of the maturity and the, the proof of the concept of the, the technology and the data streams, how mature would you say things are now? I think it would depend on what you're looking to monitor and what you're looking to improve. For example, Yannick's example on the um, HVAC maintenance and what's the um, presence of uh, COVID on uh, trains. There isn't a, a proven use case that can do that remotely yet and provide that automatically. But if you were to move into the um, more traditional elements that have condition-based maintenance, so things such as engines, such as doors, this is not something that's brand new. Uh, it's something that has been implemented onto newer build trains because those newer build trains have been a greenfield site um, and they have been proven to work, not just in the rail industry, but if you think about um, other industries such as the aerospace, where it has moved from um, a great example, Rolls-Royce being, this is the production of um, an engine, they sell an engine and all of the support comes in the spare parts they have become so confident in how they can um, guarantee the performance of those engines that they now have a commercial model, which means if those engines don't work, if that data doesn't give them the right insight, then they don't get paid. For me, that is the greatest uh, example of how uh, proven something is, is, is the provider of that solution willing to take the risk on that if this solution doesn't work, we don't get paid. And that's where we're moving towards. I think in the rail industry, we've got the um, perplexity, as Steph said, about trying to blend this solution in with existing practices. But understanding how those steps, and I talked about it in my um, one of my slides, about what are the benefits that can be achieved along the way. It isn't just a one-off benefit. There are incremental steps that allow you to get a return on investment relatively early on and then use that as a springboard into later stages. So we've done a number of projects which have proven the concept in saving time for people on the depot. And this is not hugely expensive equipment in comparison to the uh, cost of a, a new vehicle, for example, um, but also saving fuel. So reducing the amount of diesel that's used or electricity to power that vehicle just through um, implementing changes to driver behavior. So we've shown that it can be between five and 9% the fuel savings through implementing uh, remote monitoring. Okay, so I thought someone else was jumping in with a presentation. Um, <clears throat> so there are a number of ways in which those benefits have been proven um, and it is around reducing failures. It is around improving the efficiency of maintenance but also those other ancillary benefits. So reducing the carbon impact when you're uh, reducing fuel consumption as well. Yeah, thanks, Sam. And uh, before I pass Christian in, just, just reminding the audience, the pop-up slide was that feel free to ask uh, any question as difficult as you like for the panel, and we'll do our best to answer. So, so Christian, go ahead. Um, maybe just to, to add on what you just said, uh, Sam, I think the, the Rolls-Royce example is a great example on, on what the goal should be. And it, I think it fits nicely what you said, Stephanie. Um, it, in contrast to the, the engine, the, the airplane engine, which comes from the factory of, Roll, uh, of Rolls-Royce, which is not as heterogeneous as a rolling stock, right? We have different, the, the doors are from whatever, Favile, um, the engines are from whoever, X, X, Y, Z, I don't know. Um, it's, so it's, a, it's really, a, the ro rolling stock vehicles are really puzzles. Um, and if you had not have just one class, but I don't know, thousand classes, like from the 70s up to today, it's really, 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 really heterogeneous. And in, I think to, to manage this complexity, um, here, the, the, the first, what you said, uh, Stephanie, the, getting the people around, but also the data. So we have different owners of the data. 
Um, so, so for example, the owner of the door, they have intellectual property of what the door does. And then the, the guys of the train control, they may also, uh, you want to keep your data um, in, of your train control to a certain extent. So we need a model, a digital twin to take a buzzword, um, a data cube, which is logically structured in a way to maintain intellectual property rights from all the participants in the industry while having a commercial incentive, what you said, Stephanie. That is not easy. I think that is one of the core challenges in the next years, which is just a different perspective on the question of organization here. Um, so how does it work for, for Potterbrook um, to have this data cube in place where Alstom has a chunk in uh, or at their own backdoor and um, maybe instrumental for their solution? That's, I think that is one question um, that's, that we we all need to uh, need to tackle in the in the years to come um, be to 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 address what you just said, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, I just wonder on that front. I, th I think the word risk is actually quite critical to this discussion because what the data enables you to do is see risk and in some cases control risk if you've got the processes. Like necessary. insurance. Yeah. Precisely. And I I think actually the other thing that we've seen in rail is at the moment in the UK all the risk is with the train operator. And if you've got that data flow and that data pipeline that you've discussed, um, Christian, you can actually then take on risk within the supply chain that isn't just with the train operator. And then you get to this much more collaborative, integrated rail system rather than everything stopping with the top. And perhaps the supply chain's not being so incentivized to actually deliver a reliable product because- And expensive. Yeah, exactly. So I think the data is at the heart of that because it enables the person who understands the most about that particular component or asset to actually take on some of that risk in the confidence that they know when it's going wrong and they can then step in to actually rectify it before it impacts the performance. So I think there's, there's a really interesting piece there, but the data side is actually the heart of it, isn't it? It gives you that insight. Is this yep. performing healthily? And I think uh, looking forward, uh, uh, Stephanie, one option is for the uh, the OEM, you know, the designer and manufacturer to say it is our data, it's a service, it's a business stream. The other way is to release data, uh, to allow third parties to have a look and say, what can we do with the data? And ultimately, that's where a lot of the app type technology will come from, is saying we can use data from the network infrastructure manager, the train operator, the, the technology provider, and actually enhance the overall um, experience of, of users, whether it's freight companies or passengers on trains. But that, that's kind of a step change. Um, and today, uh, most companies are still quite protective that the data is seen as an intellectual asset. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there is a, a point of discussion there is, um, and perhaps Yannick, what would you think about uh, Alstom, for example, saying, yes, we could release some of our core data with a view to improving the overall journey experience. Um, which, which type of uh, data you, you have in mind, Robert, for example? I'm thinking of uh, punctuality, quality type data. So it could be, uh, for example, uh, l loading on trains. It could be uh, other services working, the catering, the toilets and so on. Um, it's it's data to, to really uh, that would help people plan their journey. Okay, um, to, to, today the, the the specification of this data um, are, are as you know d done by by the, the customers so the operators. Um, so we are following up this this specification, and um, uh, depending on the type of contract we have. Uh, the ownership of the data uh, could be uh, obviously shared with a, with a customer. Okay, so we are uh, uh, having uh, now more and more the request of, of giving this um, uh, property of the data to the to the customers or operators. Um, we we are uh, having I would say uh, two type of uh, project. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the operators is, is really mature and they have their own systems and what they just want is uh, collaboration and sharing data and we are open for it. And sometimes we are facing operators which are less mature in greenfield area 
uh, right on uh, emerging countries. And here we are providing solution as such, uh, and they don't want or they don't have the competencies, by the way, even to uh, to work with external bodies like uh, like you, Sam, uh, for developing solution. And they ask, ask us just to provide a, a, a complete solution. And in that case, um, they even don't ask for access, accessing to the data, all right? So uh, yeah, I think that will really depends uh, the profile of the of the of the customers. Yeah, thanks, Yannick. That's uh, that's interesting, and it, it's good that the the companies are, are open for collaboration is the key thing. So yeah. we have a couple Can of. Can I just add something, Robert? To that, yeah, I go think, ahead. I think it's a really important point. And you're right, Yannick. In terms of the data itself, doesn't you know belongs to the people that own and maintain those trains. Um, I think where you find the question around you know what is owned in terms of an intellectual property it's around the use of that data so that's where the commercial value is in how have you taken that um, data and made use of it um because there's a huge amount of data that's readily available um you know network rail made the decision that they would publish um, a huge vast uh, um, amount of data because they recognize that the value is not necessarily just in the data, but it's in what you do with that data to make those improvements. So to take all of the temperatures of engines and say, this actually means that you need to schedule your maintenance based on certain uh, parameters, rather than it being, here's all the data and we're charging you for access to this. It's charging for um, the insight that that data can give you. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. good. Thanks. Just, uh, just Robert, to, to share with you as well, if we project ourselves, because the title is post-COVID-19 crisis, what we uh, we foresee now in terms of data management, definitely it will be data around passenger flows, because the, 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 the operators are really to control the flows of passengers to avoid overcrowded crowded space, right, to, to avoid uh, 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 virus transmission. So we, we can deliver those data at station level or inside the cars uh, because we have two, two solutions for, for that. Uh, data as well related to um, uh, sanitary conditions. Uh, every morning, uh, cars go out from the depot after cleaning and disinfection. Is it really, really proven? against COVID-19. Do we have the data to demonstrate or the test to demonstrate that this is effectively efficient against the virus? That's a key element as well. Now we are we are uh, facing as a new challenge. Was well, not the case one year ago, right? Nobody was knowing about this uh, type of questions. And last but not least, we have more and more requests as well of data for simulating air ventilation within a car which is very sensitive as well in order to make sure that when you are in a high speed train close to your, the other passengers, the, 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 the ventilation is really safe, right? So, so that's new emerging type of data aside what you were just mentioning before, which are most probably tomorrow key questions as well we're going to have to address uh, due to this new, new environment, yeah. if, I, if I may. Yeah, thanks, Ian. So we have a couple of questions. We'll pass around the panel. And in a few minutes, we, we have another poll that we'll do. So I'll go clockwise on the screen. So the, the first question we'll look at is from, um, from Farsad. So thanks, Farsad. And Farsad asks, uh, where we have condition monitoring on trains, uh, can we also use that for infrastructure monitoring? And then in turn, is there an opportunity here for the asset owner or the operator uh, for, for collaboration um, and say, let's say business as well as improving the system. So can we start with Stephanie? Yeah, and I, I think that's a brilliant point because that's exactly an area that Borsbrook have put you know, huge focus at the moment is looking at can we use the rolling stock data for the benefit of infrastructure? And I think Sam, you gave a good example in your presentation using wheel slip activation because it, it not only tells you, you know, are you potentially damaging your wheel sets, but what is the cause of that? And is it because the adhesion management on the track actually needs a bit more attention? So, I mean, that's a really nice 
simple example, but equally, I think we've had some questions about pan cams and, you know, you can, there's track geometry type equipment that we could potentially fit to vehicles. So I think, I think that has to be the way forwards. I think as an industry, we can't afford to remain in the siloed track and train, you know, they've got to come together. And I think um, the, the noise from DFT in the UK is very much going to support that type of movement to a, a joint performance focus. I think, Robert, does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so, it does. It's a very broad topic, doesn't it? And I, I don't know if the, the others on the panel uh, are, are reading the questions as they're coming, but um, uh, um, so Christian, if we follow on with the, the same question first and far side, it was about using, uh, call it big data, uh, to benefit a number of players in the, the, the railway system. Um, is that something you see from Goit's partner as a, as a, a way forward? Um. Yeah, I think the, the question might relate to uh, what I meant with data cube or something uh, something around that. I think it's definitely important um, um, when when looking on rolling stock and the infrastructure being a big puzzle, a network, and having different players uh, around in the system, especially in, in, in the larger rail countries. So that's really, really key to use this big data, structure it to a certain extent and structure it not just by type of data, having frequency data of door motor motors, so currents of door motors or something like that, but structure it also with respect to owners or with charging gates or something like incentive gates, Stephanie, Some, so something which, which provides interaction. That's one point, maybe it's a little bit different in emerging countries, Janet, like what you said there, in, it might be not that scattered, not yet that scattered, the, the landscape. Um, so I think it's definitely worth uh, working on that. Um, and with respect, to, with respect to, I don't know whether the question also addressed me. Um, I think there is huge impact uh, between the the, uh, uh, the interface between the infrastructure and the rolling stocklet. We saw the presentation yesterday by Konox with the sensors on the switches. I think there was. It's very interesting, not just for the switches, also to de detect uh, the rolling stock, the speed and the, the weight of the rolling stock uh, running uh, over the over the switches. Or let's take wheel sets, for example, the shape of the wheel sets when we de detect deterioration of the wheel sets. The infrastructure can play a huge role here. So and Pantograph, you just said it. Um, so there are, I think the, it's a system in the end, right? The things have to work together and digitization the, the, the concatenation of all these things are, I think, the, the, the hugest benefit, but this benefit has to be realized by putting the things together. And I think we are not yet there. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. And you saw the question from Farsan as well, uh, Christian, no. specifically about the, the Panto Health uh, system. So you, you can talk directly afterwards about. Uh, yeah, I think that is it. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the just uh, screening. Um, um, from the rolling stock, getting the impulse from the catenary. I think that's a brilliant example of this interplay but on the rooftop, not at the bottom where, where the wheel sets are, but on the rooftop. But I think it's a brilliant example um, for a value added um, uh, use case. And I was going to ask uh, Yannick and then Sam just a, a technical question. So, so Alstom has the health hub approach with a ground based uh, sensor for, for moving assets like trains. We also have our train mounted and uh, going forward, particularly for rolling stock, do you see there being a role for ground based monitoring as well as on train? Yes, yes, we, we, we have definitely uh, uh, this type of need. Um, but, but if I may, I, I would like to come back on, on for that question. Um, uh, on, on infrastructure, I think it's a fair point uh, how to motivate uh, managers right, using uh, such uh, technologies. And I think this is as well Stephanie's point on uh, people adoption, right, on, on new technologies. Uh, wh what we see actually, uh, two examples on, on turnkey projects, like in Middle East, uh, we have the contractual obligation to have solution for the infrastructure as well, not only the rolling stock. Um, and actually, uh, it is a central, uh, it's, a, it's a central organization, as you mentioned, within Health Hub, and, and we are controlling infra. 
And actually, the idea here is to have a, a direct contact between a, a central organization having the global system with a predictive solution, alerting infrastructure managers by phone at this point machine on this uh, kilometer X, we have a failure, please go there. So it could be one, one way. The other way we see is, for example, in Nordics, where we have massive uh, investment on signaling uh, in the middle of nowhere, very large countries. And uh, obviously, we have a limited number of technicians for troubleshooting if any failure on signaling. So uh, we have developed a solution on the cell phone, okay, where they can get alert and on Google Map to see where is a failure. Okay, in optimizing and being able to go there uh, and, and finding and then by phone having more detailed technical information from the central organization. So yes, uh, people adoption on technology is key, but we see really infrastructure manager uh, excited as well by digital solution. So it's not always negative, I would say. And uh, <clears throat> but it's true that we have to develop modern solution and having this information on their phone <clears throat> is, is really helping, right? Mm. So, um, so I don't know if Robert is uh, it's answering your point. <laughs> no, it is. It's it's uh, 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 useful. That's good. So, uh, Sam, you want to chip in there? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, in terms of the question of you know what, so what's the balance between wayside monitoring and on-train monitoring? <clears throat> I think it comes down to what you're trying to mo monitor. So, uh, whereabouts is that asset on? the actual vehicle itself is it the wheels in which case there is certainly a case for monitoring um from the wayside if it's something such as the pantograph again i think you know things that interface with the actual um vehicle itself on the outside of the body it can be done and there are also some elements you know axle box detection from the the track side but if what you're trying to monitor is inside the vehicle and it's complicated because it's um, electrical signals that are actually involved or it's um, pressures within that system you cannot get away that you would need to monitor within that vehicle itself uh, it comes down to the level of accuracy that you're after as well um, so on the flip side to monitor um, track and um, switches from the track side you need an awful lot of equipment Whereas if you're monitoring it, the track and infrastructure from the train, you're able to utilize a smaller number of um, sets of hardware, but you are running over multiple different assets. So it very much comes down to what are the assets you're trying to monitor? How do you need to monitor them? What's the, applica what's the practical application of that? But then also what level of accuracy are you looking for? Are you looking for just does it work? Yes, no. In which case, having thousands of switch monitoring is fine. If you're looking to say, am I able to predict and prevent before it fails? Then that's a different question. And I think um, one of Farzad's other question was, you know, what does the um, business model for promoting, um, sort of, uh, for selling that into the infrastructure owner as a train operator? Um, I think it needs to be based on a, uh, what, what is the value to that customer. So um, and these are conversations with Network Rail are also asking at this point in time. This isn't um, you know, coming out of nowhere. Um, there is a pence per mile concept that I think we need to um, definitely work through with a number of the uh, infrastructure owners and maintainers. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sam. That's good. And perhaps Stephanie, I'll pass to you. We were talking earlier about uh, a move away from uh, trigger thresholds in maintenance, uh, where you hit a, a measurement trigger that then um, uh, sets off a repair cycle, to doing longer-term trending and looking at, at trends as a way forward. And explain to us how you see that as a, as a benefit to the to the maintenance regime. Yeah, and I think also this is something where if you're looking forward, this is where really where I think OEMs and also um, asset managers are really moving. So the concept really is, do you want to wait for something to hit a critical threshold before you do something about it? Or can you actually use this digital capability to trend the behavior, to see that it's actually drifting towards a point where it could go critical soon? 
And I think that's the true value really of digital. Using it purely as an alert-based system um, is harnessing maybe 5% of its true capability, where when you start to understand the kind of dynamic performance of subsystems and um, relationships between track and train, and then see those change, understanding why it's changed and whether or not that's an unhealthy or something that you need to be concerned about, I think is where the true, true insight comes from, because that enables you to plan and you move out of a very reactive industry into something which is very proactive. And you no longer have people suddenly called to arms because they've got a failure they need to remedy within two days. You can see it coming. And obviously not all degradation and not all failures will behave in that way. They will still be instantaneous in some situations, but the vast majority you should be able to trend in that way so that you can get into a much more controlled resource leveled environment, which I think would benefit the whole supply chain, OEMs all the way up to operators. Yeah, thanks for that. So I was going to launch a, a poll we have to get the audience involved. And then while people are answering, we'll, we'll jump to the next question. So uh, you'll see a, a poll popping up now saying, as we digitize uh, our, uh, our railway system and our rolling stock, where do we see the gain in terms of outcomes? So if you can all, um, uh, all have a look at that and say, what, uh, what do you think will be the ultimate uh, outcome of uh, digitization. Right, I'm just filling in my own uh, score. Uh, I'll do that. And then jumping back to, to the questions. So the next question we were going to look at is from Dr. Fjord Vikovs, if I have the uh, pronunciation correct. And it's um, uh, perhaps if I start with Christian, uh, this is saying, how can we uh, use digital implementation to move away from manual operations in maintenance and overhaul uh, to be superseded by the technology. So how can we use it as an enabler to re, uh, reduce the reliance on human intervention? Hmm. Um, I, in, the in the first moment, I thought about robots. Um, no, I, I'm joking. Um, I, I think it, it very much relates to what you just said, Stephanie. Um, digital technology helps us to perceive trends and to do things in the course of uh, maintenance um, actions in the course of other maintenance actions because we know that in the next 10,000 kilometers the wheel set will be will be off of track yeah um, i think that that is the core here we did that in 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 one project for example that was collecting data on on, on condition data on the on the on the wheel sets and then doing prediction models running prediction models every day every second to know when we think um will the wheel set be uh, will be uh, the will the wheel set be deteriorated so that we then kick off the supply chain and make sure that as soon as we have the next overhaul of the of the of the vehicle the right the right wheel set is in place to um, replace the old one, so that the that the rolling uh, the, that the vehicle, um, yeah, um, is is uh, as much on on the tracks as possible. The pure uh, 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 the question asks more about whether digital maintenance is possible. I think in the physical world, um, people need to work on it um, on on the vehicles. I think we we can't and we don't want to avoid that. Um, I, what I can imagine is to have these updates over the air, if that addresses the question, um, that you have a system that can be updated over the air, so not that you have to plug in your computer, but that you do it over the air. Um, but yeah, well, I think, um, I don't know whether this uh, really asks, uh, answers the question. No, I think it, it reminded me when I was um, a younger based at a depot in London, we would spend a lot of time with a torch under the train um so you can imagine those kind of activities these oh. days uh, you can automate for example oh okay yeah that, i think that is just just the example of the wheel sets when i measure the wheel set with the laser optical machine um i don't have to do it with this large thing i don't know the english term this large thing you have to put around it um profile so, gauge yes <laughs> okay that's the word um yeah okay sure of course and we have that for 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 damages 
um, uh, on the floor of the trains or uh, the, for, the, for the rooftop. You have already these automatic um, uh, failure detection solutions on the market. I think there are great solutions on the market already operating in Europe um, and other places in the world. I think, yeah, that's definitely a, a, um, a huge improvement because it takes so much time in the depots and not, not only time, also failures happen if people work and they work for eight hours a day and the the evening approaches failures happen so and these machines at least the failure is cal uh, we are able to calculate the failures they do and if i jump to sam sam you showed us a, a pit stop uh, picture so think about the pit stop scenario how is the digital data increasing the productivity there absolutely so um there are a couple of real world examples I can give actually, whereby <clears throat> you are able to replace what are traditionally in your vehicle maintenance instructions, actions that are check this, measure that. You talked about, you know, your profile gauge. Um, and one that we're doing for one of our customers is the uh, equivalent of the um, engine load test that would normally be the vehicle stood down in the depot and they're having to run it up. Actually, we can replicate that entire um, scenario whilst the vehicle is running out on the track which is a, not just taking away a manual task but it saves the fuel it saves the time and it's a much better indication of how that asset is actually performing because it's out on the track in the real world it's not in a depot whereby you've got different um aerodynamics around the vehicle and uh, intake and things like that so that's just one example where you can actually automate a specific maintenance task and changing the vehicle maintenance instructions is something that we're in the process of doing with that customer. Um, to answer the other side of what other options are available to automate that manual work, you're not gonna get away from people needing to be under the train with a torch at some point. Um, what you can do though is make that practice more efficient and more effective. So providing targets that say, you need to go and visit this uh, area of the train. You need to go and look at the transmission or the wheel set, or the, it appears that there's an issue with the uh, exhaust. You know, that enables you to be more effective uh, in your maintenance. But you, we also shouldn't look away from what um, Christian joked about robots, but what cobots might be able to help us do. You know, we've got a lot of experience of doing that within Unipart in our manufacturing facilities. Um, and if you think about how much of the heavy lifting is done by machines these days, you know, these machines are also now much lighter, much more mobile and are able to be a much more dexterous um, support aid for that maintenance team. So, yes, it might feel a long way off from an air gun that can take a wheel off and put it on within uh, three seconds. But we're getting closer and closer to that point. You know, the train comes in, it can be jacked up. We can then drop a bogey out, change a traction motor. All of these things are based on tack time, what's the beat rate that we need to hit. And it, it's about driving everything towards an optimized regime whereby you've got the end passenger in sight. It's making sure that you've got trains available for service. Sam, I think on that point, one of the things, the big thing that comes out of that is the skills and training that accompanies that. And I think, you know, if, if I'm someone who maintains a vehicle now, what does my world look like in two years, five years? And how do I adapt to make sure that, you know, I'm kind of included as part of that movement? And I think that's also critical for the industry that we can do all these wonderful things and build the end-to-end -end processes, but we also need to make sure the people you know, the person who's there ready to receive the vehicle, understanding the information they've been provided with and also being comfortable with that and really seeing as it as a, as a value to them. I think that's, that in itself is a challenge to make sure that we, we include all the people that are currently there and kind of bring them on the journey rather than, I think there's a bit of concern sometimes that people are trying to automate people's jobs away. And I don't think that is the case. It's about a transformation of what your, your job looks like. And just um, uh, go ahead, Christian, and then we'll look at the poll. Just one addition, uh, Stephanie. We had a pilot with a client um, in a depot with augmented reality glasses. And it took like really months until the benefit was accepted by, by the people working there. 
and the, the benefits were clear. And they, in the beginning, the system was a little bit shaky, but um, the, the, the entire problem is that they didn't want to wear glasses and not for practical reasons, but just they didn't like them. So that, and, that, and that is a very, very simple thing to overcome. If we then think about exo, ex, exoskelettes or whatever, skeletons to help people lifting things up or so, I think the, the, the hurdles might be even larger. Um, don't know. Yeah, I was going to mention, uh, Christian, as well as uh, augmented uh, virtual, there are audio systems um, that, uh, that connect into your management system. Uh, again, uh, all aimed at increasing productivity, productivity, repeatability, and so on. Now let's have a quick look at the poll, and I thought we could talk a few minutes around uh, the procurement decisions. So the poll was, where, where do we see the gain will come from as we digitize our, our railway system? And so uh, the two equal ones were system availability. So our, our trains and our um, railway system will be more available for the, the primary purpose, which is to move uh, people off freight. And together with that was the cost of maintenance. So the, the productivity of our team, also the, the efficiency of our material use and so on, will be improved by, by better, 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 better. And then looking at uh, the, uh, then in, in joint, uh, no, in second place was then the customer outcome. Uh, so increased data means, yes, the system will work better, be more available, but also as, as a user, we will potentially be better informed, better decision making. So just taking that forward then into a, a procurement decision. Um, I thought maybe we'd start with you, Stephanie, because it's um, you're a buyer of assets, you might say. But how would access to this data, would you see it as an enabler to an outcome like whole life cost efficiency? Or would you see it as something that you would want to prescribe in your procurement to say, I want this type of technology, or will you say I want this outcome in terms of efficiency? Yeah, and I think a bit of both, but definitely um, within Portsmouth, we are looking to have much more focus on the outcome and leave it to the experts to actually work out how they achieve that, but they're actually contractually signed up to delivering an outcome from whatever service, product, et cetera, they're, they're offering to us. So I think, and I think that is actually quite critical because if you think of my customer as the train operator and they, they, what they really care about is the outcome, the availability, the reliability. Um, I think there's obviously the cost reduction side of things. So from Portrait's perspective, you know, a huge focus on heavy maintenance costs. And if we can reduce those, that's brilliant for our bottom line. Um, so yes, definitely in that space. But I think we've got to move people to an outcome focused approach rather than trying to prescribe to someone how to do it when actually you might not be the expert. Yeah, good. And Yannick? Uh... Yeah, just, just to mention, actually, it will depend the profile of the customer because you may have operators, uh, as you mentioned, Stephanie, they, they, they have no current solution. So they ultimately uh, want to achieve a goal. I can think in emerging countries, right? So so then we, we, we have the liberty to provide the solution. Then you have in Europe, for example, or in US, uh, mature operators where they have already a solution and they want specific development or they want a, a solution integrated on their own solution. So we see that a lot now, interfacing solutions, which is which is key. So I think uh, it depends really the, the profile of customers. I think there's also an integration piece there, isn't there, in that on the procurement front at a much more detailed level, if I'm enabling digital systems on, on our assets, I want to make sure that data is coming off in an almost a slightly standardized format because I want that data to be able to connect with other data that the supplier might not be aware of. So there's this metadata theme, which is, can I synchronize these multiple data sets with each other? And I need to get that right at the procurement point. Otherwise, I've invested in a load of hardware that's pushing up this great data, but I've missed the opportunity to really make it like interfaceable with all these other elements. So I think that that is a key procurement question and kind of one that we should all kind of think about when we, we invest in these types of technologies. Yeah, and I think related to that is also to try and keep the, the platform, the hardware platform agnostic um, because uh, hardware is often obsolete, but, but have the data in an open portable format. So the data can move with the technology uh, is important. And just something I, I picked up. Um, so Yannick, you want to chip in there? Yeah, yeah. Another, I think, aspect to consider 
because we are talking about uh, predictive maintenance uh, technologies for anticipating failures on rolling stock and infra. But then what we see as well more and more is requests from customer for integration into their MMIS solution. So it could be Maximo, it could be SAP, whatsoever is this uh, core solution. And, and what they want, and obviously, is an integrated solution. So we need to be cap capable to, to integrate and making sure that there is no double entry uh, between uh, people managing the predictive failures and, and operations uh, in order to have an integrated solution. So that's something as well uh, we, we have to consider. Uh, so Christian? Just to add on here, um, if, if uh, rolling stock operators procure rolling stock, um, from my experience, but I obviously don't know every contract, right? But I think it's not uh, the standard case that you get digital data about your train to the extent what is required for maintenance. So digital shapes of the objects logistic data, the weight. Um, so the, the entire data set for each and every train that you then can work on it. It's a very nitty gritty thing, but it, that would be a huge leap forward, actually, if there would be kind of a standardized format, um, which uh, where you get a huge chunk of data for each vehicle you buy for every, every yeah, little su subsystem in the train that is then mirrored in this data set. That would help operators, what you said, to mirror that in their ERP system or whatever if they maintain it. It would at least be a first step because today, what at least we see on our projects, it's not, not really complete. A lot of things have to be reworked um, for maintenance purposes, not for the documentation of the train that is most of the time perfect, but for the maintenance purposes. Yeah, so we're in the last couple of minutes. Very quick question for you, Sam, from Robin. If your fleet monitoring uh, picks up an issue on a subsystem like a door, would the supplier then have access to that data? Would you go back to the subsystem provider? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So we, we're in sort of no doubt that this data can be used to the benefit, not just for the customers, but the suppliers to make reliability improvements or to make um, you know, better decisions on, you know, obsolescence. So, well, we're not going to make this part obsolete because actually we know we're going to need thousands of them over the next couple of years to upgrade this door system. So that transparency across the entire supply chain, it, I think is absolutely critical. And it touches on what Christian talks about. It's a difficult question. As a train builder, I invested a huge amount of time and money in uh, designing this. It's all sat as my IP. Why would I share that openly in a format that could then be copied? That's a really difficult question to ask. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's good. So we're coming to the end of the, the panel. And uh, as a panel, we've been talking this morning about uh, where we see maintenance going in the next uh, 20, 30 years. And uh, we can see we're in a good place to, to move beyond the pandemic. Uh, we have some very strong tools at our um, disposal that we can use. And uh, let's keep working together. So that's the end of the maintenance section. And we're um, going to pass back to Simon. So thank you, panel. And we can uh, uh, thank ourselves. And thank you for the audience and your questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And Simon, are you there? In a virtual traffic jam. Yeah, he's uh, gone for a coffee. Yeah, but uh, everyone can have a coffee break in a few minutes, actually. Whilst we've got a couple of minutes, then I think it's probably worth just saying, um, I have a round table um, where you're more than welcome to uh, welcome people to come and talk about this um, in a, uh, 20 minutes time. So um, feel free to come and join the round table, um, grab a coffee and come and sit and we can talk about these things in a bit more of an open uh, format. Um, so it'd be really okay. good to hear everyone's thoughts face to face. Yeah, and thanks for the uh, sponsoring uh, by Instrumental as well. Yeah, so si Simon, are you back now to uh, debrief everybody on the next step this morning?
no, he's gone. Uh, it's he's gone green, but uh, not uh, reconnected. Okay, so I think it's time for everyone to have a coffee break and then uh, reconnect in uh, in time for the next session. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye.